Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Film Survivor Podcast. I am your host, Tom Santilli. I'm the film critic for WXYZ, Channel 7 Action News in Detroit. I'm also the co-host and executive producer of the TV show Movie Show Plus. You can find all of my movie reviews and other content on the website, movieshowplus.com. You can also go to wxyz.com in the entertainment section to find my work. Uh, It has been a hot minute since I have done a podcast, uh, so I really appreciate you listening to this. But I wanted to get this out to as many people as possible. Today on the podcast, my special guest is documentary filmmaker Anthony Baxter, who just is uh, releasing a new documentary called Flint, Who Can You Trust? And it's all about the ongoing Flint water crisis and really just humanitarian crisis in Flint. Now, I am a uh, Detroit-based film critic, and uh, Flint is just like an hour uh, or so from my home. So not only is this an American story, but this is literally something that's happening in my backyard. Uh, Anthony Baxter, the filmmaker who I'll be speaking with in a moment, he was in Flint uh, in 2015 when uh, the crisis would, had not really even happened all that all the way yet. Uh, and so he, he put together an extraordinary documentary uh, all about Flint. Um, and I've seen a few. There have been a few documentaries on Flint, a few series on Flint over the past couple of years. And I can honestly tell you that this particular one moved me more than some of the other ones. Uh, first of all, it was very cohesive and very easy to follow, easy to understand. It mixed in a lot of uh, human, you know, real stories of the people of Flint. But it also does something that's very interesting, which is it plays with this idea of trust uh, and how we put our trust in people. And uh, the, the movie does a great job of kind of putting you in that, in that zone. As we all know, we're all looking for the truth. And it's been increasingly difficult to find what the truth is, where it is, and if we agree on it. Uh, These issues and more are affecting Flint. Uh, And I just was so taken uh, taken back by the movie, uh, and I wanted to talk to Anthony Baxter. So I had reached out to him, and we set up this interview. It was uh, set to go about 10 or 15 minutes And uh, he was gracious enough where we ended up talking for about 40 minutes. Uh, So I thought it was all pretty riveting stuff. So I wanted to get that out again to as many people as I can. I know that I haven't podcasted in quite a while, (laughs) but uh, when I have something that's important like this, uh, I feel like I want to get it out. So without further ado, uh, let's get into my interview. He's the director of the new documentary film, Flint, Who Can You Trust? That movie is opening in the Detroit area uh, here in May, as we speak, May of 2022, and will be available on demand and on Apple and iTunes, uh, as well as all other on-demand services later in May. I urge you to watch the film, and I urge you to stop what you're doing and listen uh, to this interview with uh, Mr. Baxter. I'm in Flint, by the way, to see. You know. Are you really? That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I'm uh, less than an hour away from you. I live in Chesterfield. Uh, oh, cool. So this, this is a very near and dear, you know, story to me. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. part of my community, you know. So. Uh, yeah, of course. So, Anthony, uh, thank you so much for talking with me today about your new film uh, about Flint. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to start right off the bat and tell you congratulations for making this movie. Uh, th- this movie was stellar. I've seen a lot of Flint documentaries and a lot of uh, you know, things about this topic. And I really appreciated how not only how effective your film was, but how like easily to understand and how cohesive and you know, you, you kind of broke it down for people who, you know, there's a lot as the movie gets into, there's a lot of stuff out there to believe in and what to believe in. And this movie kind of dives through all that. But for somebody who hasn't seen the film and is just now hearing about it, uh, tell me a little bit about what this movie is uh, and and why you made it. Well, thank you, Tom, for those comments. I arrived in Flint early in 2015. uh, So it was before 
the story became a big uh, news story. And I was in Detroit doing a screening of a previous film which uh, talked about water to a certain degree. It's called A Dangerous Game. And after that screening, a resident of Flint came up to me and told me about what was happening in their city. And by this stage, nobody knew about it. It, it had barely got a mention in the news. And when I got there, the, the residents were about to embark on the citizen science testing, which led to Professor Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech coming in and overseeing that initial testing and discovering these, these terrible levels of lead in the water. And the residents had been for over a year by that stage, or just, just around a year when I arrived, had been complaining about since the river water had had come on stream and the water had switched from the Great Lakes to the local river. And they had noticed the difference straight away, of course, as we know, sure. you know, hair falling out, skin rashes, that the, these terrible things that they all experienced and the smell of the water, nothing was being done about it. You know, the mayor, the governor of the state, and, and it was really frustrating for me to go in and see this unfolding and knowing in other previous films I've made, um, I've come across this before where you know, people, residents are very, very sure about something, but the people in power do nothing. And so I just stayed with the story. It became a huge story, of course, as everybody knows. And then the media left and the spotlight moved on to other stories as often as the case with a rolling news agenda. But I felt it was very important to stay with it, partly because what the people on the ground in Flint were going through after the media had left was almost worse. You know, there was a, this feeling that some things had changed. You know, obviously, they went back to the Great Lakes water and Governor Rick Snyder was saying, well, there we are. That's, that, that, that's all fine. But of course, it wasn't. And the damage had been done. We now know um, I'm in Flint today and here you can go and drive just a short distance from where I am today and you will see lines of vehicles waiting for water giveaways. It happens every week here, uh, three times a week at local churches. There's a huge distrust of the water still here and the pipes haven't been replaced. I mean, they have in some parts of the city, but not all of the pipes. And so I just felt it was really, really important to bring this important story to, to people. As you mentioned, Tom, there have been a lot of uh, films done over, over time, news reporting, but and the, there's so much uh, demanding people's attention at the moment, be it the, the terrible ongoing war in Ukraine or the cost of living crisis for people. But you know, at the end of the day, this story in Flint is hugely important still today. And so I hope in a way the film will help to shine a, a spotlight back on it and also bring to people elements in the story that they don't know about. Because I think we, we try and explain very clearly at the beginning of the film what happened. Part of it people will be familiar with. But then, you know, there are many, many twists and turns in the story that come later in the film yeah like uh you just mentioned this so like the, the subtitle of this film um is who can you trust and and this is a huge you know uh even beyond flint this is a major problem with humanity right now you know with uh where do you look to trust mm. i loved i loved the aspect of your of your movie that there are two characters I, I call them characters but there are two uh players in this story one is uh dr Edwards, who initially had come in and was kind of the first one to really uncover uh, or, or publicize the fact that something was wrong here. And then later, uh, Mr. Smith, I forget his first name, but Smith. Scott, yeah. Scott Smith comes in as kind of a, you know, a regular Joe kind of savior. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to give it away anything of the movie, but I, I, I do love this idea that that you introduce into the movie and uh, people that our trust in them kind of fluctuates and we kind of experience, we get to taste a little bit watching the movie of what these Flint residents must have thought when all these people are coming in. Add to this that, you know, it, when something this terrible is happening and it's affecting you and your, your children, um, I feel like people have a tendency to want to believe a little easier than they might normally. 
Um, they're looking for something to believe in. Talk about yeah. this element of trust and how you weave that through the film. Well, you mentioned Scott Smith. He was the chief technology officer for Mark Ruffalo's water defense group. And they came into the city here uh, when that vacuum was created, because after the media had left, as I mentioned, there was a lot of people very, very nervous about drinking the water for, for very, very obvious and, and real reasons. And they were being told that the state was continuing to lie to them. And because they'd been lied to so many times by the state and, and local officials that the water was safe when it was not, they were now being told that it was safe if you used a filter, uh, but the EPA said even that some of the contaminants weren't, wouldn't be caught by the filters. So people didn't trust what they were being told on that front. Then you had these groups come in like Mark Ruffalo's Water Defense, Scott Smith, who was the chief technology officer and originally billed as their chief scientist, went on the local news. I remember the day everybody was filming uh, the, the, this arrival of Mark Ruffalo, and they were being told, we know there are many, many more contaminants in the water and that the state isn't telling you about. And so the people are then left, and we've seen this, haven't we, in the, in the whole COVID-19 situation, you know, we're, we're all thinking, well, are masks really doing the stuff we're told, you know? Yeah. Are we, and, and there's so, we're, we're, we're having to make our own minds up a lot of the time. And that was certainly the case in, in Flint, people just unsure you know, what what they were being told whether it was true or not and you know obviously as the film unfolds we, we we're asking uh, as audience members that question because you have you know, I think at the end of the day the scientists who um, have the laboratories and who we put our trust in to do this kind of research work and to tell us whether the water is safe or not you know <laughs> They, they are in their field for a reason. And yeah. obviously not all of science agrees with each other. <laughs> there, are, there are some scientists who might have a different view to another, but yeah, Professor Mark Edwards is one of this country's leading experts in water. And so with the kind of research that he was doing, it, it, I, I felt, yeah, it, it, I was listening to what he was saying, but then I was also listening to what, Water Defence was saying, and uh, as a documentary filmmaker, when I'm following what is going on, I'm simply just taking in what's coming into the camera, a bit like the, the news people on the day. I mean, you do what you can at the time to fact check and everything, but obviously we've had a lot more time over the years because it's taken five over five and a half years to make the film. But for the people at, at the time, when these stories are kind of spewing out every day, um, it's so hard, so hard for residents to know what the truth is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I wanted to ask you too, you know, um, there in the film, you mentioned Scott Smith, there's, there's a somewhat contentious uh, interview that you have with him in, in the film. Um, I wanted to ask your, your thoughts on kind of what was going through your head, you know, while that was taking place. Uh, and also just from the perspective of, you know, I've talked to a lot of documentary and uh, filmmakers, and I would put you up there with, with some of the better ones that in the sense that the best documentaries, uh, they kind of search and they present, and then they kind of leave it up to the audience to decide, you know, what to do with this information. Mm -hmm. If you're, if you do more than that, it's considered manipulative and people can kind of see your agenda. Um, so I, I like that you you brought up all of these things in this film. Um, so I, I guess first I wanted to ask you about the, the Smith interview and then also if you could lead into, you know, what should people do with this information now that we have it? Mm. Well, I think with the Scott Smith interview, it's a bit like whether the previous films I've done um, where sitting down with Donald Trump and 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 speaking to him, I always think of the people at the heart of the story and what they've been going through. And my job really is to try and present that to whoever I'm interviewing really, and, 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 to, and to almost be a voice for those residents. Because one of the things that's very striking to me always is how powerless sometimes people feel in these kind of situations. They can't 
And that's why I sometimes are in the film, because you, you have to have somebody putting those questions to people. Um, and so I just was really in my mind, just trying to put myself in the place of the residents and knowing, having filmed with Scott Smith over a, a long period of time by that point, um, I thought it was important knowing what I then knew about the, 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 the outcome of the story really, that it was important to, to really kind of hold him to account. Now, there are lots of people, as everybody knows in this story, who need to be held to account, whether it's Governor Rick Snyder, who dodged um, interview request after interview request. I mean, I was able to speak to him at press conferences, but it was, you know, it, it, it's frustrating. You have to just put yourself in the place of the residents and 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 get to the truth of the matter as much as you can. Um, and you know, at the end of the day, as you say, Tom, it is up to the audience to make up their minds. And I'm looking forward, actually, to a screening uh, this weekend with the residents in Flint present uh, here in the city and some of the main people in the film as well, who mm -hmm. will be seeing it for the first time. And, you know, these are people right at the heart of the story who have, have lived through this nightmare for so long um, and continue to live through it. And... I think yeah, the, the the you know, I know from seeing the response to to the film that that people are left often angry by these situations. It, it's it's um, but I think it's really important that it's left to the audience to make up their minds and to watch the film. And and this is the first part of a you know, an ongoing process really that has to continue about what's happened in Flint and what continues to go on here, that it's not just a story that's got, been and gone and everything's fixed, because that is just not the case. I wanted to talk to about um, what I th also thought in today's climate, everything is so politicized uh, that mm. people sometimes when they don't know what to trust, they, mm. they try to find some kind of beacon of, well, there's a guy I know that's on the left, so I should probably agree with him. Yeah. Or there's a guy on the right that I should probably agree with him. Um, and it's like a mind F, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> it, you know, like, again, like a lot of people who are consider themselves liberal or on the left, you know, they see a person like Mark Ruffalo come in mm -hmm. and we, in, I instantly, you know, oh, okay, what they're doing must be the right thing. And then you see what Smith is doing uh, over time. And then you're like, wait a minute, like what? And they kind of just overturns the apple cart uh, yeah. in your mind. The talk a little bit about, you know, in this society where we're, we're living in this polarized environment, there's a barrage of information, you know, tomorrow, you know, yesterday's news story might as well aired a year ago, you know, cause people are just flooded with all this stuff. Um, what, what can, what can we do to keep mm. the story of Flint relevant to the, you know, most Americans and, and most people? Well, I mean, you made a couple of important points there, Tom. I mean, I think that this thing about Mark Ruffalo coming in, you know, left-leaning actor who is a terrific actor, everybody would yeah. say that. But you're in this position where somebody like him comes in and people are listening to what he's saying there were mistakes made um i think by everybody in flint but i think it's an important part of this story to keep that in the film a lot of i would imagine commissioning editors would look at this and they'd say oh well we don't really you know, mark ruffalo is great we don't want to upset mark ruffalo fans well yeah. i'm sorry you know we've got to tell the story as it is and sure. this is this is the story um it's not the whole story, it's a part of the story. And I think the ongoing situation for people in Flint um, just has to be kept in the news. And the, the film is only a, a, an element of that, but yeah, having Karen Weaver, the mayor of Flint formerly at the screening in New York um, the other day and hearing what she's had to say, and she's also written um, uh, articles about this too, about the ongoing 
plight of people and the ongoing um, hardship of people. We all know that this last couple of years with the pandemic and everything has been terrible for, for everybody. But here in Flint, not only have they had that to deal with, but they have the water disaster aftermath to continue to deal with too. And so if you, you go further imagine, back, you know, people who yeah. know the history of Flint know that, I mean, th th this is bad. This is terrible enough to have happened to any city, let alone a city with this kind of history. Uh, exactly. Of, yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Sorry. And, Sorry. and you know, they're, they're very strong people. It's obviously a question that's often asked, you know, would this have happened in a rich white suburb of Washington, D.C.? And the answer overwhelmingly is no, it would not. You know, it would have been fixed, um, you know, but people have, have gone through so much here. And that, that's very admirable, the way people deal with it, but they shouldn't have to keep yeah. dealing with it. And, and I think it's, it's terrible the way that, that people have been treated here. The fact that there hasn't been a cent of compensation for the residents yet. The fact that nobody in power um, at the time who are making these decisions has really been held to account for what happened. Yeah. Um, and the world moves on and the news cycle moves on, but the, for the people of Flint, it's very, very difficult to move on when that trust is still shattered today. You talked about, um, I wanted to ask you about this, uh, you know, because you talked about how, how, you know, some people might view and look at and say, oh, Mark Ruffalo, we wouldn't want to upset the Mark Ruffalo fans. Um, the movie is narrated by Alec Baldwin and, and he comes in at the end um, for, for some scenes. Um, did, were you afraid when all the stuff came out with the rust uh, stuff that he's going through right now? And this is no judgment on Alec Baldwin what, either way, but were you worried that his presence in the film would be any sort of distraction uh, for the movie? And did you have any thoughts of uh, limiting him or cutting him completely or any, any thoughts yeah. like that based on just what he's going through in, in the in the public eye. Absolutely. I mean, we were going to release the film beginning. Um, uh, we, 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 launched at a film festival initially back in 2020 uh covid hit we had to change plans we couldn't show it you know at all the film festivals it was booked at uh, then we were going to release it in october when the incident you referred to when alec baldwin um was uh, the terrible tragedy on the set in, in new mexico and the and the shooting dead of a cinematographer we were releasing the film the following week and mm. so we decided to to pull it um because out of respect for for all involved with that terrible sure. tragedy but also i felt it was just going to mean yet again the residents of flint would be sidelined because any interviewer right. was just going to focus on that story and we didn't know at that stage at all what what had happened and so yes we thought about you know changing the narration um Alec is a, a, a very good narrator. Um, he is also somebody who's passionate about water, which is why I approached him in the first place. I was interviewed him on a film um, previously and um, I stayed in touch. And I wanted this film to reach as many Americans as possible. And as a British, you know, white guy coming into a, 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 a city like this and wanting to reach many, many more Americans. I, I looked, thought about trying to find a narrator who would tell the story and be sympathetic to it. And Alec offered to do it. And we we didn't, you know, most independent filmmakers have uh, struggle with, with fight, paying, paying the bills as it were for, sure. for hiring anybody to, to do narration. And so, you know, when Alec offered to do it for free, you know, it was, it was very, generous of him um now you know after that incident we thought about you know we maybe we should replace the narration because we didn't want it to to you know detract from the story but sure. you know alec, alec didn't want to be replaced you know his view is that he has done nothing wrong and so why should he be punished you know for 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 you know something that he 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 feels he he you know isn't responsible for directly. So there's that. And then if you approach any other narrator, they're going to say to you, well, you know, first of all, is, is Alec happy to, to be replaced? Um, no. And right. also why would 
anybody really want to do that you know and, and sure. then there'd be the cost of doing that so I, at sure. the end of the day tom it was a tricky decision but i just felt that you know there, there were value there's a value to to his interview i think with the mayor of, of flint at the end karen weaver um he was passionate about coming to flint and learning having seen an initial cut of the film wanting to know more about what the residents had been through as a filmmaker you know i was tempted of course to film that because i felt something yeah. might emerge and i felt it was, it was strong so it was a it was tricky and it is tricky but i think that at the end of the day he does a really good job of the narration it's um you know he has a sympathy for for what's gone on here and he's passionate about it and you know we we want the film to get out and you know the the moment you put a film back on the ramps and start messing yeah. around with it it's going to be another six months you know sure, sure. um this might be a very difficult question to answer but i want to ask it anyway you know as infuriating as as this whole situation is um and the damage that's been done we can't go back in time we, we're here today mm -hmm. and moving forward what what is needed to solve, or I shouldn't even say solve, but what is what is needed to uh, for this problem? Is it is it money? Is it uh, do the pipe do the pipes of you know every house in Flint need to be replaced? Uh, what specifically, if if money were no object and politics wasn't a real thing, <laughs> what does the city of Flint need to to save them? I think the pipes do need to be replaced. I mean, at the moment, there's been a replacement of pipes from the main uh, lead lines through to people's homes. But the, the those big pipes under the cities of America and, and my country too, they lurk there. We don't really know, you know, the full story and history of those pipes. And I think that here, there would have been such a, um, it would have been such an act if the if the federal government had put up the money for a, a massive pipe replacement program and just done it right at the beginning as you say we can't talk, turn the clock back and you know we are where we are but i think doing that work today would really help people's confidence you know and still you have the 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 this question of people feeling that the pipes that have in their houses you know they they don't feel they're safe and why should they and that, and that's a real yeah issue and i think for those people who are concerned about that they should be replaced um and the other thing of course is the impact on children who um have, have really sort of been set back not only by the lead poisoning that they endured but also uh just the lack of investment anyway in education here and that they have, have now got a double fight to, to, to battle to fight there. And then, so there needs to be money there again, but also a, a constant kind of analysis really of the impact on, on these kids. Um, and it's not just children, of course, it's people of all ages who, who were you know, involved in this and drinking this, this terrible water and, and being affected by it and continuing to have their lives affected by it. And I just think there needs to be a, a recognition of that like it just needs to be said the whole time by the people in politics here as well that that it, you know there needs to be a sense of understanding that trust needs to be rebuilt and it's still completely shattered and it doesn't help either the water bills here are the highest in america and that people yeah uh, still fear that if they can't pay their water bill they're going to get their water shut off and then, you know, the, if they have kids, then they're, they're, they could have their kids taken away because they feel that uh, you know, they wouldn't be in a, in a suitable house, you know, without any water supply. And all of this stuff continues to go on. And there's this massive sort of fear. And I, I think also with the water giveaways, um, there should be still water freely available for people who uh, want it. I mean, I don't... Yeah, I mean, speaking to you from a hotel in Flint, and I am drinking the water uh, today. I wouldn't have done that, you know, when I was here making the film, I, I would say. I was drinking bottled water all the time. Now I'm listening to what Professor Mark Edwards says, that the, the water here is as safe as any other city in America. Now, I'm putting my trust in him, 
as a scientist and I'm believing that. But if I was living here all the time, would I believe that? Probably not. So yeah. I think those people who don't believe it should have access to free bottled water for as long as they want. And there I mean, should be no messing around on that front either. I mean, your film shows scenes like heartbreaking scenes of elderly people like, yeah, the water is available to them, but they're they're being asked to carry it back and forth on a day to day yes. basis. And and like just the the the, the lack of uh, thought and care to all this is insane. But um, I think yeah. it was Alec in the film who asked a question I think a lot of people outside of Flint ask, which is why why do these people stay there you know and and what what is it about them that 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 makes them stay there and they talk about how you know one of the residents talks about well that's you know their family their entire family's there mm. their their entire life is mm. there it's it sounds so easy from the outside to just say oh pick up and move out of flint um mm. but this is their this is their home uh what did you i mean this is maybe a loaded question because i'm sure that you found some tough, resilient people, but just talk a little bit about the people of Flint, uh, the, the victims of, of this mm. crime that did not deserve this. Well, I mean, maybe it's because I'm you know, not from the United States, but coming here back in 2015 and staying here for the best part of five and a half years. And the first families that I went into and started filming with, I just found people really wanting me to to help them tell their story and there is a, a, a I don't know whether it's because I'm an outsider in a, in a in a funny kind of way whether that helps whatever but I have found the people here to be just so inspiring I mean they're very very resilient obviously having gone through what they've gone through but they're also people that uh, I would counts as friends in a, in, you know today as often happens with when you're making these kind of films because you 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 develop that bond with people i mean it's partly because i tend to work on my own as well with with just a camera and a radio mic um yeah or two and so you're you you're you're pretty much sort of documenting what you see and 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 what you see in the film is what i saw and there were many many hours and hours of footage of course that, that aren't in the film um that, that there's many really important stories that unfolded during that time that had we been able to make a series which i would love right. to have done that sure. we could have we could we could still do that today but it's you know that the what people went through during that time i just felt it was so important to document and there is something also about the city which i really love i mean i've i've been coming here now sort of you know for seven eight years and I just really enjoy all aspects of, of it there's something that gets under your skin it's a bit like with Detroit as well I feel the same way there and it's a really inspiring thing to to continue to meet these wonderful people um and to feel that you know what small bit I can try and do in 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 making this film and trying to get their story out there will hopefully have some kind of impact to to the to their benefit in, in the future. Who knows? But that's the that's the sort of the the plus point, if you will, of doing this kind of work that you feel that you are, in a way, doing something small though it may be to help continue to put this important story under the, the national spotlight. And this will be my final question for you. And again, I appreciate uh, your no, time worries. here and everything. Yeah, no uh, worries. But uh, uh, to, to kind of summarize here, if I could put you in a situation where you were in front of somebody who had the power and the financial clout to make a major change in Flint, uh, what would be your, what's your pitch to them? Well, I know we've touched a bit of this, but it is certainly the pipe replacement. It's jobs of future, giving a, um, a city where obviously General Motors was the life and soul of the city and the car industry. That has to be, you know, front and center of its future in a way, because there is still um, a huge 
manufacturing base here, there needs to be hope. There needs to be a um, a, a real sense that that people have got a future worth striving for, and it's you know, all of the educational assistance too in the schools and to get rid of the blight in the city, the, the kind of boarded up houses and abandoned places, just have this sense of decay. And, and moving on from that, I think is really important. It's, it's just having a, a sense of pride in the place, which is definitely here. I mean, there's an amazing new museum that's, um, you know, about to be reopened and the Flint Institute for the Arts, all of the um, things that are, have been developed here, the downtown improvements are all kind of really great to see. Uh, but they are only, you know, a small part of it. It's what people experience day in, day out, you know, and, and the crime level and the injustice for people in so many ways. Um, I think that all of those things, it's, it's a long, long list, but it is certainly the case that it has to be a, a, yeah, the local and, and governor level has to be characters and individuals who people can trust and who people vote for. And then if they get into power, that they don't let people down in the way that you know, Rick Snyder did and the, the former mayor. Um, it, it's really difficult to watch those scenes in the film where yes. people like Rick Snyder just doesn't listen to the people and the former mayor is saying the water is perfectly safe to drink when everybody knew it wasn't and they just weren't listening. Yeah, I think it's so important that these politicians listen to what residents are telling them and act on it rather than just ignoring it, which happens all over the world, of course, we see it all the time, but it is really uh, depressing to witness and there needs to be lessons learned and changed from what happened here. Uh, with that note to, you know, I, I, I lied, I have one or two more questions for you. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I wanna ask again, you know, people uh, oftentimes with documentary films, especially that are about topics such as this they they see it they might be affected by it they might be really affected by it uh and a lot of times they they want to help but they don't know how to help mm -hmm. do you have any advice or guidance for people like that who what they should do or where they could go to be an active part of the solution for flint well, there are a lot of organizations. We have some on our uh, web, web website as well, flintdocumentary.com, uh, that are out there working to assist people in Flint. Uh, if people wanted to support our film and to reach more um, eyeballs in America, we've got a Kickstarter ongoing at the moment to try and get the film into more theaters because Great. there is a a strange thing with these kind of films that if you get people in a cinema to which we can now do again thankfully after yes. the COVID restrictions have been lifted watching a film together it does have a power that that just streaming online doesn't have and also it tends to get more uh reviews and all the rest of it so it's just important to us to try and get the film out as widely as we can so that's another way i suppose just in terms of supporting the film which then in turn supports the residents because the more people that see the film the more people know that this story hasn't gone away and it hasn't yeah. been fixed so um th those are a couple of couple of ideas and then uh lastly you just mentioned about the film uh, rollout where in the short term where can people find this this film and, well, and are there any idea i know you mentioned I, and i agree with you about seeing it in yeah. a cinema yeah but uh are there plans to have it streaming yeah. as well uh, to just to get it out there more? Yeah, so so the film is available at the moment in select cinemas. Um, and then from the middle of this month, it'll be available on iTunes, Amazon, the usual digital platforms. Okay. But part of it is we want to try and get it on television as well, get it seen widely in America. And so the, this release strategy is built around trying to get more people to see it now, get more a bit about it 
talked about the story talked about and then hopefully one of America's great broadcasters will see uh, the possibility of getting this story out and the importance of getting the story out today in front of an audience um, and and to make sure that uh, all the attention that they gave the story back in the day isn't just you know, something that they think well we've moved on as well I think it, it you know it has to just try and reach people and so that's our strategy at the moment well, again, I uh, I love the movie. I'm I'm going to be talking heavily about it on uh, WXYZ, where I'm the film critic on se- uh, Channel oh, 7 here in, in Detroit. Uh, and I'm going to be posting this interview in full and trying to do my best to get people to watch it. I can't imagine that people could watch this movie and not leave wanting to tell somebody else about it, at the very least. Uh, so thank you for uh, all the time that you gave to Flint and uh, for this film. And I wish you and, and the film nothing uh, but the best moving forward. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks for taking the time to talk about it. Appreciate it. So that's my interview. And I appreciate you listening again to this Film Survivor podcast. This is my first podcast in well over a year. Uh, and it's not because I don't like the format or don't want to, but I just have been busy. And honestly, uh, I haven't been getting the exit interviews from Survivor, which is uh, what a lot of people listen to this podcast for. Uh, you know, this film, this podcast covers uh, people that love movies and also that love the, the TV show Survivor. So uh, I've just been busy. So that's where I've been. But I, I do, again, want to get this kind of stuff out to people. I think it's important that we don't lose sight of what's happening in Flint. And I think it's important that people who are affected by the film, like I was, uh, that they have some kind of an outlet or they know, they know what to do uh, or where to go to help. You know, a lot of us, yes, a lot of people stand by and watch bad things happen on the sidelines, but I think there's an even more uh, amount of people that want to help and they want to affect positive change in the world, but they just don't know where to start and they don't know what to do. So this particular topic with Flint, I think people can help just by watching the film, getting the film Uh, to be seen by more and more people and I think the more and more people that see it will be affected by it and hopefully we'll be able to do something to put some pressure on those in power uh, who can actually make a real difference to the the lives of the people in Flint who have been terribly affected uh, by this unthinkable unimaginable American ongoing disaster. I'm Tom Santilli with WXYZ, Channel 7 Action News in Detroit. I'm the film critic there. I'm also the co-host and executive producer of Movie Show Plus and the host of this podcast that you're listening to, the Film Survivor Podcast. I hope to be back soon. We'll see. Uh, Let me know if you like this thing. uh, Comment, share, uh, give me your opinions and your thoughts. And of course, if you do watch the film, make sure that you leave your comments as well Uh, because I am interested in engaging with my audience. So thank you. Until next time, I'm Tom Santilli. Well, I'll, I'll be Tom Santilli next time too, but we'll see you soon.